This is going to be a really good session. And it's 12.04, so we're going to start now. Colleen, are you excited about today? Oh, I'm so excited because I can, like I was saying, in everyone's comments that you've been sharing, you can literally feel the creativity and the excitement and the passion for people knowing what lights their soul up and for us to now help scaffold you into like, how do we start moving towards that as your actual reality is so exciting. It is so exciting, right? It is so exciting. I feel like this is where, for me, this is my political stance. It's like, I want every human to just do, do what they came here to do. I'm like, whoa, like what a revolution, you know, instead of like talking about things, how about if we were busy using our own two hands and all of our gifts and skills to make an impact in the world? I feel like that could go a long way. So let's get into it. So here's my message for you. This is, if I can make t-shirts, Colleen, we probably should make t-shirts, but if I can make take t and we'd have to team up with like Rag and Bone or James Pierce. Like we can't just, they gotta be super soft. You know, those kind of t-shirts you really yes. want to wear. Yes. Yeah, she knows. <laughs> So, but if we can make a t-shirt, one of the t-shirts we would make is, you ready guys? You've been assigned. That'd be the t-shirt that you were put in this world because you are needed. Because you're needed. You know, a friend of mine, he had an experience. He was in Australia and he was actually asked to come help this kid who was dealing with some really serious bullying really serious stuff. The kid, you know what's, oh God, is it so sad. It's so sad. I was actually bullied really badly in seventh grade. Colleen, have you ever had an experience where you were bullied? I have. And it's, I think no matter what age, no matter what phase you're in, it always, it just hits you to your core so deeply. So deeply. And that's a whole other thing is like just the, the way in which the kids were mean. I used to actually go to the front office in seventh grade, because I didn't want to go to the lunchroom because nobody would sit with me. And so I would go into the front office and uh, it was really horrible. And the point is that there was this kid and he was going through so much and his parents had tried everything and it was really dangerous. He was at a point where he had really tried to do some scary things and they sent every, they sent everything to try to help him, you know, every, every thing that they could possibly try and it wasn't working. And they thought, this is really critical. And so a friend of mine got sent in and he walks in and he says, if you came to tell me what the priest told me, it's not going to work. And he says, oh gosh, what did he tell you? And he said, he told me God loves me. And like my friend says that on the spot, he th thinks to himself, but that's pretty good. Darn it. Like, what am I going to say? Like, that's actually like a cool thing to say. So on the spot, he says to this kid, well, I wasn't going to come to tell you that. And he says, what were you going to tell me? And he said, well, I was going to tell you that God needs you. That you're needed. And the kid bursts into tears. What do you mean I'm needed? How am I needed? And they had a whole conversation. The kid starts to get really animated. He wound up leaving that psychiatric hospital. He wound up helping thousands and thousands of kids. We are assigned. We know it. We know it. You know, in a Jewish wedding, everybody's seen, we, we all know certain symbols of certain religions. We just don't know enough. But we know that there's like the breaking of the glass, right? Colleen, you've seen that, right? They break a glass and they scream, muzzle tov, right? That's like in the movies when people have a Jewish wedding. Why do you break a glass? It's an interesting thing, right? Like this couple is in like one of the best moments, hopefully, of their life. And then the first thing they do, the first step they take as husband and wife is to break a glass. And the answer that the Kabbalists give is so beautiful. It's to remember that the first thing you do is remind yourself that the, the world needs to be put back together that there's broken pieces and that your love together, your mission in the world will be to help each other to be more of your potential so that you individually and you together will be a part of putting the world back together. It's so beautiful. 
And the Kabbalists say that, you know, it's so interesting because thousands of years ago, before we had the science to know about the Big Bang, which now everybody's on board, right? Everyone's on board. There used to, there used to not be that, you guys, right? People used to think that the universe is always was the size and it always was this way. And then scientists were able to say, oh my gosh, it's expanding at this rate, which means we can go back and see where it was from where it was. And then they actually could count back to where it was and how big it was. And it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, and there's a there's actually a scientist from MIT. His name is Gerald Schroeder. He wrote a book called Genesis and the Big Bang. And it was a really cool book because he was able to see something so crazy, which was that MIT scientists now fully understand this Big Bang and all this stuff. And everybody around the world signs off on it. And in the Kabbalah thousands of years ago, it's all written there. And they didn't have any technology, right? They didn't have the, the apparatuses and the microscopes that we have, but they just wrote it down. Like the universe was once the size of the pupil of an eye and it started to expand and it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then there was this shattering of this light, this giant light it shattered in all these pieces. And they write all of this and it literally is exactly a mirror image of what it says in the studies of how we understand the Big Bang. Well, that means that inherently this world is designed with all these shards of light and everything in the world is designed to make it all connect and come back together. And everything has its important place, everything, right? If we know what happens if there's no bees, right? We're, we're in trouble, right? Like we know what happens. So we are all needed. So I want you to get that we talked about it this week that there's like this arrogance and who, who do I think I am? But it's like, who are you to think you're nothing? Like, what is that about? Like, who are you pretending to be when really you're you? Like you came with a mission. Like if that couple, they're not just there to like make themselves happy, right? They're there to become more of their potential to do this thing called their mission. We are all here to help someone else. We are all here to elevate this whole thing called the world. And I don't know about you, but I think that what we really want is not just, not just to leave a mark, but it's like, you wanna leave a legacy. Like how cool would it be, right? You wanna, you wanna be that person, right? Like, when you, when you like list off the names of like Picasso, Steve Jobs, Walt Disney, like how many names are in that list? You know, Maya Angelou, right? Like how, how many names are in that list? And why not? Like we're each made of the same electricity, which is supposed to be expressed in our unique way. So for then us to come along and go, who am I to be? what is this? It's like, can you imagine a palm tree? Like, who am I to be a palm tree? It's like, that's your job. That's your job, right? Colleen's like, I love the palm trees. She's like, <laughs> she's like looking at, she's like, it's so beautiful, right? And if you drive through Beverly Hills, it's interesting because I think of Florida as palm trees, but actually Beverly Hills has some really big, they're so tall. Like if you drive down Palm, actually, it's named after its street in Beverly Hills, it's like Palm, Maple, Ochre, it's all actually named after trees. And if you drive down Palm, you've probably seen these iconic photos. They're so tall. Like you can't even believe that they're not snapping because they're so freaking tall. Like, can you imagine a palm tree being like, I'm too tall. I'm too tall. It's like, you're supposed to be tall. Like be tall, like do it, do your thing. Do your thing, girl, do your thing. Oh, it's kind of like the opposite of arrogance, right? Like, can you imagine if Oprah would have been like, I can't be this this big. I can't take on this role. How could that? How could I possibly? It's like, oh my God, the roads she's paved. She will never know how many roads. She will never in her lifetime be able to see the ripple effects of her being so big. So was that for her? No, because there is no her without us, right? We are we. We are one ocean. We are one collective consciousness. We are one species. We are one race. We are one family. So it's like, who are you to not be big? That's so not okay, right? So write this down. Playing small is canceled. It's canceled. Playing small 
is canceled. Colleen, what are you thinking as I'm saying all this? I get really pen get passionate. I do because you just have this beautiful way of awakening it in everyone who's listening to you because we recognize the truth, right? There's a way you say it where we just know it's true and we have been playing small and we can choose differently. And it's really is that simple. It's a matter of choosing to stop telling the same stories and making the same choices every day so that we can actually step into what we're here to do. So good. And let me just teach you a little something. Okay, how many of you type a one in the chat if you know Carol Dweck's work? She wrote a book called Mindset. She comes out of Stanford, tons of research. She helped a lot of inner city schools to change their grades completely so that the kids could actually have a totally different life trajectory. And then that work was applied to so many other things. So there's some amazing research and Angela Duckworth also did a lot of research and she wrote a book called Grit. And I interviewed her and I just wanna leave you with, with, with some of these nuggets as we go through today. So you may have heard about this study. They took a group of kids, okay? And they gave them a ring of, a, a key ring, or, you know, like picture a janitor's key ring, like a hundred keys on this big key ring. And they handed it to a group of kids and said, all right, we're gonna put a video camera in here and we're gonna set a timer for like one minute. And we're gonna see how long it takes you to find the key that opens this door. And we're gonna lock the door now. And they did it. And what happened is it was hard. They couldn't do it. Stay with me, gets good. So they couldn't open the door. And they did it again with another group of kids. They couldn't open the door. And they would say, I don't know, we don't have enough time. There's too much pressure. Like it's too hard. There's too many rings on the, there's too many keys on the ring. And then they decided we're gonna do something different. They took all these gorgeous kids who come from all different parts of the city and all different ages and da 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 in a certain grouping, but all children. And they gave them superhero capes, okay? They put superhero costumes on them. Everyone got to pick red, green, blue, didn't matter. They're all superheroes. And they said, we're gonna put the camera on. We're gonna give you the same amount of time. I'm gonna give you this group of keys and we're gonna see if you can open the door. What do you think happened? Mm -hmm. They opened the door. What? Say that again. They opened the door because your subconscious is so much more in charge than you think until, of course, your consciousness can hopefully override it. But what, what happened? What happened is they believed on some deep level that they had superpowers. And so they assumed it. And so it was. Now they did it with adults. They took adults and they said, we want you to just read these words. Sounds really easy for adults who can read, like doesn't seem hard, except here's what they did. They put a group of words on the board and they said, you're gonna read these words, okay? Or yeah, you're gonna read these words. And the words were all the names of colors. So it's set on the board, purple, red, green, blue, orange, except the purple was written in blue. The orange is written in green. You get my point. The brown is written in teal. No, 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 no. So the adults would get up there and they would say, just read off the words. You know how to read, right? Yes, I do. Great. Read the words. And the purple, which was written, let's say, in orange, sometimes they'd get it right. Sometimes they'd get it wrong. By the time they got through the whole list, most adults would get one or two of them wrong. Okay. Because, you know, there's a trick going on, right? You're seeing orange, but you're reading purple. You're seeing blue, but you're reading green. You guys get it. Here's what they did. They took this group of adults and they said, let's see if we can get better results. They gave them all lab coats, which they said came from the university down the street where these scientists had these lab coats and they would put these lab coats on. Put the lab coats on, walked in the room. What happens? Don't miss a beat, read every word as it says. What happened? Why? Because they believed that they were really smart. They believed that they were scientists. And so Carol Dweck makes the argument 
with very clear data that we are pretending to be somebody. And most of the time we're pretending to be somebody we're not. But when we really know who we are and we believe in who we are, we're gonna win every time. So when I say you're assigned, when I say, who do you think you are that you can't do it? I'm really serious, right? Like what's the difference from Beyonce and some really, really talented girl who lives three blocks away from where she grew up? Well, Beyonce claimed it, right? But we are all given this electricity, okay? So what is it that you wanna create in the world it's available. And what did I say on day one? We don't get what we want, we get what we are. So if you're a match for greatness, if you're a match to be an outlier, if you're a match because you wanna leave a legacy and you're an icon, then you are, it's done, right? And I mentioned Oprah a few minutes ago. It wasn't arrogant, but she knew first. She knew that she should have her own show before they knew, because you go first, the universe responds, you're the tuning fork. Jamie Kern Lima, right? They said, no, she said, hang on a minute. Give me a second. I'm thinking, I'm thinking that, that I got this, right? So you've been assigned. So I want you to make a list one through five, and I want you to start every single one of your answers, one through five, like this, if I didn't have to be perfect, I would. And I want you to write it. If I didn't have to be perfect, I would this. If I didn't ever write it five times, but I want you to start it. I want you to rewrite those words, even if it feels tedious. If I didn't have to be perfect, I would write a book. If I didn't have to be perfect, I would, what? What would you do? Please write it down and then put it in the chat. And if you only wanna put like one of them in the chat, that's even better because you don't need to put them all in the chat. Colleen, they're getting it. You feel it? I feel can. the vibe. Yeah, you can totally feel the energy of it. It's so exciting. It's so exciting. So if I didn't have to be perfect, I would what? And then put some of your answers in the chat so we can read them off. If I didn't have to be perfect. And then we're going to go into what are the ways that you can turn this into gold? So Devorah says, if I didn't have to be perfect, I would create songs, uh, everyone, everywhere all the time. How do you know when to move ahead an idea versus waiting to be confirmed? There's a question. Good question. Open an herbal bakery. If I didn't be perfect, I would see myself through Kathy's eyes. That's so beautiful, Nancy. Well, I think you do. Uh, Lori says, make gorgeous things that make other people feel gorgeous. Beautiful. Be a full-time muralist. I don't want to be perfect, I would fly. Host retreats for mothers. Start my life coaching business. Podcasts, amazing, gorgeous, great, so good. Yeah. So here's the thing. You know, Tom Petty used to come off stage and he said that he had to pace in his hotel room for about an hour after every show. And he said it's because he literally felt possessed because he knew that he was standing there with his hands on the guitar, but at some point he didn't feel like he was playing the music. This is a phenomenon. And Michelangelo said that he would paint and after a while he like, he knew his hand was moving the brush, but like he didn't feel he was painting, like something was moving through him. And they've now studied this and this is called flow. And what is flow about? It's about being so in flow with consciousness that your ego lets go of preparing, predicting. Because why do we do that? Because we want to protect ourselves. We, we don't want to get hurt. So we want to overthink. We want to over this. We want to over that. Uh -uh -uh. When you're in flow, you're not the one moving the paintbrush. You're just getting out of the way. So your ego quiets down and you move into something called actual full blast creativity. And that's where you see Will Ferrell just like riffing, riffing, riffing. And he's laughing because he's like, I didn't know I was about to say that eight seconds ago. It just came out of my mouth when his ego quiets down. And then this thing that's not predictable comes through. 
But the subconscious doesn't love the flow state because it says, well, I don't know how to prepare. What if I feel stupid? I'm self-conscious. I want to protect. I want to predict. But you don't see P. Diddy like laying down beats in that state of like, hang on a second. Like, like that's not how it goes. Like it comes from opening up to what is in this place where my self-consciousness is not trying to predict. So the I didn't have to be perfect thing is really important. So I want to go one step further, and I want you right now to think about that little girl who came up in the meditation yesterday, who's seven years old, who you gave it a, you know, you gave her a hug, you looked at her, you saw how lovable she is. We need to write a permission slip for her. All right, let's bring her to mind. I can think of myself. I can remember my red sneakers. I can remember myself. I had two missing teeth right here. I can remember the punky Brewster looking girl. And I want you to picture her and I want you to write a permission slip to her right now. So you're going to say, dear Laura, dear Kate, dear Lexi, dear Kathy, write it down. I give you permission not to be perfect, period. I give you permission to make messy things. I give you permission to play. I give you permission to iterate. I give you permission to explore and have fun and sign it. So you're going to write, dear Laura, dear Kara, dear Kathy, I give you permission to not be perfect. I'm just repeating it. I give you permission to make messy things. I give you permission to play. I give you permission to have fun and explore. Sign it. This is where your genius is gonna come up. You're gonna bump right into the mystical. You're gonna bump right into what it feels like to not just live your life, but to find your greatness. Your greatness is on the other side of getting that ego to shut up, right? And quiet down. That's where creativity is born. That's where ideas come from. That's where your passion, your beauty, your consciousness, your love, your vitality, that's where it's gonna come in, right? Every time I went to the studio to write a song, I wanted to turn around. I wanted to cancel it. And every time I would go there, I would leave with something that didn't exist two hours earlier. Like, oh my God, I went there with nothing and came home with something. Like, I can sing you this something. It exists. It's a song. Never heard it before. Now it's here. I had to be willing to let go so that can come in. So there's five different types of things that I've seen that people have made into businesses. Okay. And here they are. You can be a maker. You can make things. You can write songs. You can make cupcakes. You can make knitted dolls. You could be a teacher. You could teach people how to knit dolls. You can teach people how to write songs. You can teach people karate. You can teach people bookkeeping. So you could be a maker. You could be a teacher. You could be a curator. You could say, you know what? I love photography, but what I love more than taking pictures is pulling together a gallery show of all these different black and white photos of Coney Island with different women, with female photographers. You know, I really like food, but I don't want to make food and I don't want to teach people how to make food. I want to curate food from different parts of the world, right? I would say Phil Rosenthal is like a curator. He goes all around the world and he like tastes things and show, showcases different places and right. Maker, teacher, curator. You could also be in the service world where you're like, I want to do this service for somebody. I want to organize their closet. I want to design their house. I want to cut their hair. I want to take photos for this person, right? That's a service-based thing. And then the last one is to be in the content investigator space. So investigators are like Malcolm Gladwell. Like I'm so interested and so curious that I could spend all day just gathering data and research on outliers. I could spend all day just interviewing and gathering data on happiness. I could spend all day gathering data on, gosh, I mean, what makes sex better or even something tangible like, you know, nonfiction and or or fiction or children's fiction or puppets like I mean you could you could investigate any topic right and create content around it create a podcast create books um so that's really the five things that I've seen and I would say coaches 
fall into that teacher space, right? You might want to teach people something. You might want to hold that space. You might want to create a retreat or some kind of experience or some kind of course, right? That's in the teaching category. Which one feels most like you? Maker, teacher, curator, invest, content creator, service person. And here's the deal. There's three steps to starting a business and they're not hard. And I'll tell you what they are. The three S's, select, sell, and scale. Three S's, select, sell, and scale. So the first thing we do is we pick, we choose. Second thing we do is we sell it. And the third thing we do is scale it, okay? So the selecting thing, people get really stuck there. Colleen, what have you seen is the reason people get stuck in the selection process? Yeah, they, they get stuck in the closed loop of, but I don't know what my thing is. I don't have clarity on how I'm going to be able to move forward so I cannot get started. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. Remember Ross Geller? I was obsessed. I mean, now I look at him like, David Schwimmer, okay. But like for 10 years, like completely, like as the character, the character and like the, yeah, and the, the chemistry between the two of them was so good. It turns out, I think they felt it too. So we came to find out. Yeah, it was real. But, yeah, it was real. But we know that famous scene, which is also on t-shirts where he says, pivot, 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 right? He's so funny. Um, we always pivot. We always do. Like, you're not going to avoid the pivot. I think, what, what did he start? Elon Musk, he started like PayPal, right? He's with Peter Thiel. I think he was part of that, right? And then he did something else. And now he's going to the moon, right? A little different. But it's like Kanye West, I mentioned him before, right? Starts with music. Well, he started producing music. Then he started rapping music. And now he's making shoes. And who knows what he's doing, right? So we're designed to be in the pivot. So what I like to say is choose anything. Here's how you can choose. Choose the thing that just feels the easiest right now. Choose the thing that one person already told you that they would be interested in. Choose the thing that seems the most interesting because here's the deal. Whatever you choose, and we'll talk about the lessons of what comes next, when you apply the strategies to whatever you choose, you can then do that again with anything else. So what he learned to do with PayPal, he could do with Tesla, right? What he learned to do with Beats, he could then do with shoes. So business is fundamentally, it really works the same, which is why I went from selling music, right? Creating, creating something, having a story to tell, finding a client, knowing how to understand their needs, knowing how to sell it and sell it and sell it. And, you know, if somebody does something once, you could say, oh, you got lucky, right? But if someone does something over and over and over and over and over again, there's something that's consistently working that's being applied, right? And so first I started a business and I was selling music and like, I don't know, 20,000, 40,000, I started making 400,000, $500,000 a year. Then I started teaching songwriters how to do that. So then I had clients who were songwriters. Then I started pitching other songwriters. I started an agency and I was an agent for other songwriters. Then I started to teach courses. Then I started a podcast. Then I grew the podcast into a seven figure business. Then I wrote a book. Then I started doing events, right? But it's all the same stuff. It's all the same stuff. It's all the same stuff. So I say select something because to let that get you derailed is such a bummer because it's like, we all have to pivot anyway, and we all have to iterate anyway, and we all have to throw spaghetti at the wall. And it's just so fun to get started. And it's going to, it's going to tell you what it is. You know, I heard Seinfeld and Larry David talking about Seinfeld and they said, it was like, while we were creating it, we were like, oh, this is what we're making. And then Jenna Fisher was on my show from the office. And she goes, it was like the end of season one, we're like, oh, this is what we're making, right? Like, as you're making it, you go, wait, 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 I want to add this. Wait, 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 it's really that. Wait, 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 right? So you select, great. The second thing you do is you gotta sell it, but how do you do that? Well, the first thing that you do is you give it away for free. Every single thing that you and I have ever gotten to be consuming, whether it's a play you saw, it was first workshopped for free. It was a table read for free, they tested it. Every time you drink something, the Sani water or iced coffee from Starbucks, they gave that away for free so many times first. They tested that. They tested the name. They tested the flavor. They tested the way the cup feels. We're not allowed to test. We're not supposed to test. 
eh, right? We got to test it. So we sell by starting with giving it away for free. And then we get feedback and that's what they do, right? You, you, wanna, you wanna find out why Honda made that car? They tested it, they sat in focus groups and then they heard feedback and they said, please, this isn't a failure. I want your feedback. Feedback is, a, is an answer key. This is amazing, right? So people said, we like it in a color gray. We like the button to work this way. Amazing, great, thank you so much. We get the feedback. Then we make another free iteration of it. By the way, all of this can be done very quickly. And we'll talk about that more too. You give it away for free. Now you've tested it a little bit. And now you're like, okay, I gave these gluten-free cake pops away for free. This woman said she liked it, but she said she would rather have it cinnamon. I made it cinnamon, she loved it. All right, now you're starting to cook. Now you say, can I sell this cinnamon cake pop? And let's say you sell it to one person. You get one person. You're like, ooh, is that person satisfied? Now I got something that what I do next is scale that. How do I do that? I find more people like that person to sell that cinnamon cake pop to. Who's getting it? Type a one in the chat if you're getting it. So this is part of why we do a 12-week program is because not only do we teach you the details of everything we were talking about earlier in this week, we spend six weeks on that, just really wiring ourselves out of our subconscious into the memorized state of our flow state, our conscious. But then we spend six weeks going into all of the nitty gritty details, giving you assignment and giving you live interactive classes with us, or we're looking at your homework, doing your homework, and you're actually building the business if you so choose. And some people say, I'm just good with the first six weeks. I didn't really want to do that part, but you get both. You get it all. So we got the select, sell, and scale. Now let's talk about scaling because people really love that part. You know why they love that part? Because everybody wants an audience, right? I ask people all the time, do you want a million dollars or a million followers? And people go, um, like they're get, they go, I guess the million dollars, I really want those followers, right? But that's actually coming not from only ego, that's coming from a part of us that wants to make an impact. We want to have influence in the world. That's good. That's healthy. So how do you do that? How do you build an audience? What do you think matters, let's just say, for somebody's revenue in their business? Do you think it's more important that the business would have more followers, okay? or less followers. Now you guys know, like she's setting us up. But if I said to you, I'm looking at a business, I'm looking to invest and I want to know which one would be a better investment. Do I invest in the business that has 10 million followers or 10,000 followers? What do you think is the answer? Catherine, you're so smart. She said, the right followers. So she's getting really warm. So the answer is it has to do with engagement. Okay. Let's, let's go back to my friend, Seth Godin for a second. So in his book, this is marketing. That's the name of the book. It is actually a book that will teach you more about empathy than it does about business, which is why it's a business book because business is the ultimate relationship. Business is about empathy. Business is about really understanding what somebody wants and needs and listening and showing up for them, which is why I love helping people start businesses because once you're in that quantum place where you feel good, boy, do I want you to give it away. So I love helping people put those two things together if that's on the table. So in the book, This Is Marketing, Seth Godin explains, there's two kinds of song, songwriters, artists. Let's just use them as an example, The Grateful Dead and Taylor Swift. So he said, Taylor Swift, is, she's phenomenal, by the way. She's so, so talented. It's ridiculous. She was writing that, that level of music at the age of like 14. It's really, the, her hooks are just crazy, right? So he wasn't saying this to fault her. He's just using this as an example. So you have two great talents, Taylor Swift and the band, The Grateful Dead. Now, what's different about them? What's different is Taylor Swift was on the top of the Billboard chart over and over and over and over and over again. And she lived in the world where there was social media and she had, I'm not going to, I don't know the exact number, but it's like zillions, right? Millions, multi-millions and millions of people heard her, know who she is, know what she looks like, know a couple of her songs. 
the Grateful Dead didn't have that. They were actually not on the radio. They weren't played on the Billboard 100 ever. Now, what's the difference? The difference is that Taylor Swift fans might say to you, I love Taylor Swift. I've seen her in concert. And you're like, oh, that's so cool. Where did you see her? Oh, I saw her in New York. Oh, I saw her in LA. Oh, I saw her twice. Oh, that's so cool. But that's not what Grateful Dead fans say. They say, I love the Grateful Dead. Oh, how many times have you seen them? 412 times. Oh, you've only seen them 412 times? I've seen them 1,000 times. Oh, you've seen them 1,000 times? I've seen them 2,000 times. Like, this is a thing, okay? With Taylor Swift fans, people will be like, oh my God, I love her. I have her record. With Grateful Dead fans, they don't say I have the record. They say, I have 49 records. I have every record. I have the lost records. I have the B-size. I have this record. I have that record. So what's the difference? The difference is that people who like the Grateful Dead don't really say that they like them. They love them. They're obsessed with them. They actually feel like it's part of who they are and their identity. People who like Taylor Swift, they like her. They might also like 20 other artists. Do you feel the difference? There's a big difference there. So Seth Godin uses this as an example in his book because he says what actually is fascinating is that the Grateful Dead made more money than Taylor Swift and they were not billboard superstars. Hmm. So is it about depth or is it about width? Scaling and building an audience. And what I'm here to tell you is so much of what I do in this workshop, in the programs I teach with people that I coach is I'm literally there to rewire your subconscious so that you can actually go ahead and succeed because you're meant to succeed. And the reason why is because we overestimate oh, I could never start a podcast because I need a million listeners. Oh, I could never even bother starting an Instagram account because I need 300,000 followers. Oh, I would never bother starting a coffee shop because there's already eight other coffee shops and I would need this many customers. No, it's not true. It's actually not true. It's actually not true. Let's talk about what is true, okay? So my friend Britt used to work at Facebook and her name is Britt Morin. She's amazing. She's definitely a woman to be following right now. She's totally an outlier. And she told me that when she worked at Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg said to her early on, oh my God, this business is going to be insane. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be different than anything the world has seen. And she said, why is that? And he said, because we just got the data back and it shows that every person who uses Facebook refers it to 1.4 people. Our virality is 1.4. And she said, 1.4, that doesn't sound like a lot. I thought you were going to say our virality is like a thousand or 900 or 10 or 20. You said 1.4, that's not even two. And he said, no, it's everything. And so we saw that again with COVID, right? During the height of the pandemic, the doctors and the, the news was saying what the doctors were saying, which was if the R factor was one or more, we were in trouble. And what did that mean? It meant that if one person immediately transmitted COVID to another person, just like that, like it was a done deal, one person gives it to one person, no, no matter what, we have problems. But once the R factor went down under one and it was like 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, they said, oh, the hospitals are having such relief. Why? Because it wasn't a fait accompli that each person would definitely transmit it to one person. It was like 0 0.6 of one person would transmit it, right? So that made a big difference. So what does that mean for your business? It means depth. It means if by the end of the day, you could fully and totally satisfy one person and they would be like, oh my gosh, I loved that podcast. Then what would happen is they would be compelled to tell one other person. And this is the phenomenon known as the tipping point. And this is what Malcolm Gladwell writes about that Tom shoes and so many of the things that you guys, we've come to know, that's how it happens. It happens because one person tells another person, but here's what you have to know. When you get a survey, when you're leaving the grocery store and like, oh, well, you fill this out, you're leaving Target. You, there's a survey at the bottom of the receipt. They're not interested. If, if it says, how likely are you to refer this business? And there's a one, two, three, four, five, seven, nine, 10. Anything under a nine, not good news for them. Because what we're noticing is you have to be totally satisfied, but if you are, those nines and tens, they don't need everyone to be a nine or a 10. They have enough nines and tens, their business is done. Their business is gold because the nines and the tens tell one person, now it's viral. That's what viral really means. 
So when I started my podcast, I remembered that the Talmud says that words from the heart enter the heart. They just go right in. That's just how it works. There's no filter. Words from the heart. When you are in that place, you are fully in that flow. You're fully in consciousness. You're fully awake and you're coming from passion. There's no way for it not to enter someone else's heart. And so I thought to myself, you know, these people are telling me that I need like 12,000 downloads per episode in order to even like make it anywhere near the Apple chart. And I was like, well, I don't, I can't figure out from my limited perspective how 12,000 people will find this. But what I do know is I can only speak this way. And so speaking this way makes it that way. Are you guys getting what I'm saying? And so one person told one person, and we've never done an ad for the podcast. We've never put money behind it. And we are in the top 20 of all business entrepreneur podcasts. And we're in the top 1000 of all podcasts in the world. And we're in the top 100 podcasts for all things like in our soul sphere. And it's just been that way. And we're in the top 1% of the 1% of podcasts. Like there's 1% of all podcasts. And of the 1%, we're in the top 1% of the 1%. And that's because this actually works. That's because what Seth is saying about the Grateful Dead is the truth. And when you hear this, how exciting or how exciting is that for you? Because now you're like, wow, I get that. So if I showed up for somebody and they were excited and they were felt fully and totally satisfied and they told somebody, I'll have a giant business, right? So type a one in the chat if you're getting this, if this is landing for you. Colleen, anything that you're thinking about that you want to add? I just want everyone to remember, like when we talk about this depth, the beauty of that, right, is that you don't need a huge audience to have not only beautiful impact, but also to start earning money from doing what you love, right? We get caught in this idea that like, I have to have all of the followers, I have to reach a certain threshold before this can ever be feasible, before I can ever be viable financially. And it's like, no, it's not about that. It's exactly what Kathy's saying. It's about how much of your own resonance and your own vulnerability and your own presence are you bringing and offering out to people? And the more you do that, the more you are just inevitably for a match of people who reach back out and say, I want more, I want more. So now let's move into my favorite topic, which is the money part, really, because I really feel like everyone is willing to go with me into expansion up until the money gets involved. And all of a sudden the ego gets so triggered by that, that it shrinks. And I was on a podcast. I told you this morning and I I actually liked it so much. I told this guy, I was like, can I have this audio? I want to play it on my show. I thought he did such a great job. And he asked me, so tell me about your own journey, like where you got stuck. And I was like, well, it was really interesting because after living in Jerusalem, I was so plugged into what I really am, right? My soul. Of course I landed that record deal. It was like, there's no, you got no strings on me, you know, but then I got dropped, but we all know, I all, I, I all know now that I dropped it. I dropped it. I was a match for getting dropped. Right. And so they followed in and it got dropped. And I said to him, and I realized it was cool for me to attract and to receive. Right. But once someone was going to start paying me and putting me on a stage and giving me lots of stuff, my ego said, uh, 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 who do you think you are? Why you got so much money now, girl? What's happening to you? You're going to become a terrible person, right? And all the stuff we talked about earlier. And I didn't get right away that that was ego. And I was like, I'm going to lose everything that matters. I won't be in integrity. There's no way, right? It was just, and that's where my ego, because what's that about, right? right? Like Oprah, she's like, I want to have as much as I can coming through my ecosystem so I can help all those girls in Africa. I want to have all this coming through so that I can thrive and be an example to other people. They can thrive too, right? Like the whole ocean is the whole ocean, right? The waves aren't separate from each other. The waves aren't separate from the ocean. So why would we all of a sudden get confused and go, who am I to receive? It's like, you're not you. You're part of the ocean. Let it come in, right? So let's talk about money for a second. During the pandemic, right, did you see that you heard stories that Gucci and Louis Vuitton just went bankrupt? They didn't, right? All throughout, you know, the last 20, 30 years, are there customers at the 99 cent store? Yes. Are there customers at Whole Foods? 
Yes. Are there customers for every price point? Yep. Are there times where I want to go to Target? Hell yeah. I get lost in Target, right? I come out, I'm like, I went in for deodorant and it's a $608 bill. Like it's impossible to like go in for deodorant, right? There are times where Target is like, it hits the spot. Also Dunkin' Donuts sometimes hits the spot. There are other times where Target would not cut it because I'm in a moment, I'm in a mood where I want to tell myself a story about this energy exchange and I want to walk into Gucci and I want to buy a pair of sunglasses and I don't want them to be any less than $600. And it feels so good, right? We just bought flights up to New York and I love, I love making that first class ticket. I love that first class choice. My husband's like, it's only a two and a half hour flight. I'm like, why have money if you're not allowing yourself to use it to experience experiences for me? It's like the best use of money. So what are, what am I saying about money? Okay. A lot of times people get stuck here. They want to make a lot of money and they say, but I need to make something that's affordable. I need to lower the cost. Who would I be to charge a lot for these invitations I make? Who would I be to charge a lot for this jumpsuit I make? Who would I be to do this, to do that, to do the other thing? What do you think you're doing for your customer when you think that way? Truly, what are you, what are you co-signing for your customer when you think you have to make something really cheap, really inexpensive? You're co-signing scarcity. What you're saying is, oh my God, I would never charge a lot because I agree you have no access to abundance. So I'm going to make something really cheap because I agree with you. So money is so hard to come by. You can never get it. So I'm going to make something cheap. Now, what is more expensive? I'm going to ask you a really important question. What's actually more expensive? Something that's cheap or something that's going to cost more? What's really expensive? If I buy something, like let's say I buy a couch from Ikea. And I could also, let's say down the block, you could buy furniture that's like full cherry wood furniture, nothing engineered wood. It's like full solid oak, but it's more expensive. Which one lasts me longer? My dining room table downstairs, my grandmother bought in 1948. I have it in my house. It's cherry wood. It's solid cherry wood. When we moved it here from L.A., the mover was like, oh my God, I have never seen anything like this. I was like afraid to like injure it because it's like solid cherry wood. And I was like, and my grandma said to me, one day this will be in your house and it'll be in your kid's house. And my grandma grew up in a tenement in the Lower East Side coming from actual total and complete poverty and used to spend money on things that were valuable and used to say, don't you get confused. If you buy food, that's cheap. Is it more expensive than food that's expensive? Well, it depends what you value. If you value your health, then buying food that is processed and filled with preservatives is really expensive because it just costs you your life. So it might make more sense to spend the money on the organic farming because you're not buying price, are you? You're buying the value of it. All day long, people sign up for a gym and a lot of times they're like $9 a month. Sometimes they're $13 a month. What does the study show? How many people actually get to that gym? Turns out it's really expensive. Turns out those gyms make the most money because people don't come. I, in LA, before the pandemic shut everything down, I belong to Equinox. Costs like 300 something a month. Do you know? that that's actually cheaper in a way because Equinox actually has a full gym. So they actually have to use that money to replace the equipment, replace the towels, keep better teachers there. And oh, guess what? People actually show that their health improved because they paid $300. So what did they do? They actually showed up for class. So is it more expensive to pay $300 or to pay the $9, but you're never going to use it? So you could just set it on fire. Like you could just take $9 a month and just burn it, just incinerate it, just throw it in the garbage can. Or you could take $300 and say, 
Oh my God, look at my body. Look at my health. Look at my cholesterol. Hmm. Type a one in the chat if you get what I'm saying. Don't sell price. Sell the value. And co-sign for people that they, they deserve value. They deserve abundance and that it's available and they don't have to keep playing into scarcity. So also when I'm teaching, right? And just so you guys know, because a lot of people have been asking, what do you what do you even do? So the class that I teach is a is a hybrid. It's like live, live coaching calls on Zoom where we can see each other. And then there's also amazing videos and modules of me and workbooks that you can get started. So you get both. It's called Abundant Ever After. And people are like, oh, well, I could buy a, a, a video, you know, for $40 or $10, or I could, I could get it for free on YouTube. There's so much content for free. That's true. Information should be free. There's a lot of it out there. But a lot of people have information and what are they missing? They're missing the implementation. They're missing the actual transformation, right? My friend Ramit Sethi wrote a book called I'll Teach You to Be Rich. It's a great book. It was New York Times bestselling book and he's from India and he comes from a lot of scarcity and he, boy, did he zoom past that. And when he was at Stanford, at Stanford, sorry, Stanford is a place, Stanford is a college. Uh, when he was at Stanford, he remembers his roommate saying, I can't believe that you spend $200 a week on a trainer. Like you don't have that kind of money. And he was like, oh, but here's the thing. I need to get straight A's and my energy level is a totally different thing if I'm working out and I won't work out without accountability. So he said to his friend, what are you doing? And he's like, well, I get all of that on YouTube. And he goes, but do you actually watch it? And then when you watch it, do you actually do it? And he was like, well, not really. And he's like, well, I'm like finding that I get a lot more done because I'm in the gym and it's changing the whole way that I'm eating and thinking and all of that. So I'm just going to keep up with this, but you do whatever you want to do because that's working for you. It's awesome. But it wasn't working, right? So what we did is we designed this program, right? The same way that I would want you to design things where it was like, yeah, no, it's not free. And it's not cheap, it's about value, right? I'm not here to be cheap, I'm here to get you a transformation. And what I did is I saw that in the industry, there were all these people doing online course things and nobody was completing anything because all these videos were just sitting on people's desktop or in some membership site and nobody was actually completing it. So I said, we're gonna do this together. We're going to do it live. We're going to implement together because you don't need a to-do list. Do you need anything else on your to-do list or do you need a to-done list? Do you need more things that you hope that you get to or do you need to say, oh, hell no, I'm done. This is my insurance policy that I show up and she shows up and her team shows up and we together cross this ocean and I'm done. I will no longer say, I'll just figure it out. No, I'm doing it. I'm doing it and it's done and it's done and it's done. So um, this is really important to me because I know that seven-year-old girl. I was that seven-year-old girl. I've spent time now, you know, we've had 62,000 people come through our workshops, 62,000 people. And I feel like it's that starfish story. You know, where it's like that guy's throwing the starfish in and this guy's like, why would you do that? Like the rest of the starfish are all washed up on the shore. He's like, well, it mattered for this one, right? 62,000. It's like, there's not even enough, right? Time. I'm like, get me at it. Like I, we have so much to do. I sit here and I'm like, you didn't come to just pass time. Like you came to be great. You came for greatness. You came for a legacy. You came to enjoy abundance and to offer it to other people around you. So. I like to help you think about the way you pay for things, the way you charge for things, the way you tell a story to your client about what they deserve that they, they need to know what they're worth, right? So all of this is, I think, super valuable. And yes, just so you guys know, I wanna tell you this also. So our program, Abundant Ever After, it's basically $297 a month. 
And it's a 12 week, this live container. So you get 12 calls with Colleen, you get nine live calls with me. Every call is two hours. Plus there's bonuses. And I'm, I'm going to tell you this right now. So if you guys sign up in the next 24 hours, you get the wealthy woman bonus, which is an additional three live sessions with me and three juicy guest experts. One is going to teach you tapping, which is something really cool that Colleen knows a lot more about than me. Breath work, we're going to do a breath work session and also a manifestation expert is going to come in and do that. And we're going to like get into it. The other bonus, if you sign up next 24 hours is I have a podcasting jump starter workshop, which is really life-changing. And the truth is that my podcast, and we'll talk about this more in detail and especially more in the class, like scaling a business has a lot to do with creating intimacy. Intimacy is currency. Intimacy is velocity. And so podcasting is a certain kind of a medium where there's such a deep connection happening. And if I told you what's happening in podcasting, it's amazing because when people are watching YouTube, let's say, and you keep their attention for four minutes, that's like crazy huge. Like if you can keep, because people are multitasking and they're moving around. But what we see in the data with podcasting is that the people who self-identify as I want to listen to this kind of content, I want to listen to a podcast, they listen to the entire episode. And what happens if you listen for an hour to somebody over and over and over again? You start to trust them and know them. And then what happens is the advertisers are saying, we're getting our biggest ROI from advertising and podcasts because the intimacy is so there that when the host says, I really love this thing, things grow. And what we're seeing is that when people have a podcast and then you create your own business, whether it's a product, it's a service, if it's an event, even if you have 84 listeners every week, 12 of those people are going to come to that event and it's going to grow and then they're going to tell someone else. So podcasting is amazing. Now we also have a sort of platinum level of our program, which comes with a full podcasting program, not just the jump starter, And it also comes with a virtual um, online summit and a few other bells and whistles. And you guys can look at both of these things by going to kathyheller.com slash join. But honest to God, like I'm quite aware that this is the best thing happening. Like this, this is to, to spend this kind of money and have this kind of exchange is just so valuable. And so I love being a part of it. And truthfully, like and I know I've said this before, it, it shouldn't matter so much that Colleen has a PhD because what really matters is that we're both completely and totally certain of your full expansion. And when you're in that, it just becomes reality. And so what we've seen people do is just mind-blowing. Colleen, what's, your, what's been your experience of, of being a part of Abundant Ever After? Oh the kind of community and collective that Kathy draws into her world is extraordinary. And so when you can begin to walk this journey for three months alongside other souls who are so there with you, right? Because there's a lot, there's a lot, a lot around the world and the life that we all typically exist in that people aren't always super open to stepping into possibility and embracing our own expansion. So when you can link arms with other souls who are committed to that path and who are right there with you and dropped in and cheering you on and supporting you and walking that same path, the power from that is beyond words. It's literally magic. It's so magical, right? I asked James Clear, who wrote this book, Atomic Habits, what's the most important habit? And he said, people used to ask me that and I would say, they're all important. And he said, but now I know the most important is who you spend time with because you become a match for those people. And so once you get into this oxygen, it's really incredible what starts to happen and people make lifelong friends and people become business partners and people go on each other's podcasts and people become each other's first clients. And it's just wild. Mm -hmm. But I want to be very clear. The promise of this program is two things. The first six weeks of this program, we will rewire your subconscious. We will get you into state. We will get you into your, into your actual consciousness so that you start to feel your actual self, your I am, not your ego. And you start to feel so good. And you start to play in this space where you can just a attract and receive and manifest because you are a tuning for, you're playing that A note, A notes are coming back. That's it. That's the first six weeks. And really the second six weeks is like a bonus because all you really need is those first six weeks. 
And we said, let's go further. So the second six weeks is idea to income. Second six weeks is we will take you now from this place where you're feeling very lit up and very much more like yourself and very much more clear what's possible. And we will select and sell and scale a business. And we will do it all in a way that doesn't even feel like anything you know about business because it's all built on this feeling of empathy for you and for others, which is really a we. And it's built in these very easy steps where you're going to say, oh my gosh, okay, I can't do step nine right now, but Kathy just said this week, we're going over this. I can go do that. I can give this away for free right now. Okay. I can go test this. She just now asked for feedback. And next thing you know, you go, it's working. This person who I just gave this free organizing hour to, she, she asked me, what do I, what I charge? I'm like, that's how it works. Yep. 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 That's how it works. Then we're going to tell you how to grow your audience. Then we're going to tell you how to do social media. We're going to tell you how to do social media in a way where it's engaged, right? I want you to look at my feed too, because there's so many people on social media who are like, look at me, I have a million followers, but how many comments are in the posts? How much life is there, right? You want to have an account where there's, there's people being social and actually supportive and loving and, and helpful to each other. Because then one of our, one of our students talked to you, she's amazing. She decided to create a business during COVID and she had 300, not 3000, 300 followers. And she said, Kath, I was so excited because I netted in eight months, 60 plus thousand dollars. And I was like, that's amazing. And she goes, and then from there, I couldn't believe she goes, now last month I made 12 grand. Now, what did she do? She's from Pakistan. It was COVID. She started to think with her consciousness in big possibilities. So I'm going to wait a second. I love Pakistani clothing. It's hard to find it. I don't sew it. I don't make it, but I could find it from women who make it in, in, the, in those countries. So she started to sell traditional, gorgeous, Muslim, beautiful garb. And how did she sell it? Because it was a pandemic. She started to do it with the intimacy because we talk about the intimacy goes so much further. So she started to set Zoom appointments with people to say, would you like to see some of the collection? And then instead of people buying one piece over Zoom, they would buy six pieces. And then she was not only able to support her family, but she was able to give money to women in Afghanistan and women and orphanages in Pakistan. She started making a huge difference and she's amazing. And now she's actually creating a whole platform called Let's Come Forward. You guys should all go follow her, where she wants to be on stages and create retreats and help women of all different backgrounds to really feel seen and supported. Let's give it up for that. That's what I'm talking about. That's true expansion. And it's so exciting, right? We had Greg Franklin, who was living in Missouri, and he was so depressed. He was making... He was making his living working at a dog food factory where his job was to stand in front of a machine that made plastic bags for dog food. And he goes, I know I'm like a guy and you don't really teach guys, but like, I just got gravitated towards you. And I've been so depressed for so long. And my parents didn't raise me to be like living on cloud nine. It was just like, get a job, get healthcare. You know, he's like, I have three kids and I don't want them to see me um, just kind of like this, like, I'm so unhappy. And of course he's unhappy. He's standing in front of a machine that makes dog food bags. So he said, I'm just going to make something. So he starts to iterate and he makes cheesecake. And he said the first day it was terrible because he forgot to use a cheese cheesecloth. So he decides to do it the next day. And this is on his breaks because he works the night shift sometimes, sometimes he works the day shift. So he's home, makes two cheesecakes. And the next time they came out really good. So he said to his wife, well, we're not going to eat the second one. So he drove it to the firehouse in his local town in Missouri. They call him a week later. Hey, are you the guy who made that cheesecake? He said, yes, I am. They said they really liked it. Could he make 12? Because the sergeant was having, a, the chief was having a birthday. Makes 12, figures it out, doesn't know how, just says, yes, let's go. Next thing he knows, he starts to take some cheesecake, put it in a freezer bag, charge whatever he felt he could charge, goes into town, starts selling him, knocking on doors, post office, going into the salon, the barbershop. People were like, what are you doing? He's like, you want to buy a cheesecake? Like he just took inventory. He just used what he had. And then he got fired from his job at the dog food factory. And his wife says, you're not going to believe this. Look, go, go to Google. She said, type this in. Today is national cheesecake day. And you just got fired. She goes, I didn't even know that was a day. 
So he said, Kath, we made the decision that instead of me getting another dumb job, I'm going to open a brick and mortar. And if I can make enough money to pay the rent for one month, I'll keep the shop open for three months. They opened the first day, a line around the block. He made three times the rent in the first day. Then I have him on the show on my podcast to feature him and talk about it. And one of our listeners calls him and says, I listen to that podcast. I own a chain of grocery stores in Missouri. I'd love to put your cheesecake in the store. During COVID, his wife was able to leave her job, work with him, and he deserves, his kids deserve that too, right? We had Tumi, who was living in London, Nigerian girl whose parents gave her every opportunity to move to London. She's working in publishing, not a bad salary, but not happy. And she says to me, I don't know. I started listening to you and I was like, I really want to do something else. I'm really a vegan and I'm really excited about being vegan. And I really would rather teach people how to eat vegan than sit at this desk. So she decides to start messy. And instead of opening a restaurant, which she couldn't afford to do on day one, she said, you said, just iterate. So I called up a local restaurant and said, could I do a pop-up vegan Nigerian night at your restaurant? And they said, yes. So that's a success. She writes a vegan Nigerian cookbook called the Plantain Cookbook. She said, Kath, in just three months, I made over $80,000. Then she's tweeting, she's posting, and Whoopi Goldberg is going to be in London, reaches out to her and says, could you make my friends and I a private meal? She goes, I couldn't believe it. I go, there you go. Where are you now? You're not in the 3D, right? And on and on it, it goes. And... It's amazing how much well-being comes in when we are willing to sign up for, what if this could happen? What if I'm designed not just to kind of get through the day, but to feel so lit up and to help other people? And is Greg Franklin and his cheesecake shop, is he just helping himself right now? What are his kids seeing, his three kids? What are they seeing? What are the people in his little town seeing? right? What about Tumi, right? She's a Nigerian girl, right? Living in London. Do you think that's making an indent? I think so, right? And what about, what about Takti's, right? Like, and by the way, I didn't even make notes to tell these three stories. They just came to mind, but there's literally thousands of other stories like this. And I love those three stories actually, because they're all represent such different people in this world and everyone deserves right? You were put here to serve and you were put here to feel really good. So we are so excited about this next round and we will be starting. So enrollment for this program will close next week. And if you sign up, if you're going to sign up anyway, you may as well sign up in the next 24 hours because you're going to get two bonuses, which are the wealthy woman, three extra sessions, one with a person to do tapping, one with a breathwork specialist, and one with someone who specializes in manifesting. And I'll be there live too. And then you're also going to get a podcast starter, extra juicy like workshop, which just gets you started and going and cooking. And then there's also the platinum level, which gives you a virtual two-day event. Plus it also gives you the full, a full podcasting course, which is really, really great. But if you sign up in the next 24 hours, you may as well, because you're going to get all these extra goodies and enrollment will close next week. Does anyone want to put any thoughts or questions in the chat? And I will tell you that tomorrow, we are going to do another day as we told you, and we're gonna come back and we're gonna talk more about how to take these dreams, right? And how do you, what's the next step, right? What's the next step for you to allow in the most magnificent life for yourself? And we're gonna go deeper with that. And we're also gonna to get to have an experience that's different than the one we've had for the last three days because we're gonna be on Zoom if you wanna join us at kathyheller.com slash party. And that means you can be on Zoom and we can unmute some people and we can talk to you directly and you can talk in the chat and um, it's just going to be such a gift and it's going to be so much fun. So if you want to meet us tomorrow on Zoom, do that. But we got one more whole day. I hope you guys have really, really felt a shift. Type a one in the chat if you felt a shift. I, I've, I've had such a great time. Colleen, is there anything else that you want to say before we sign off for the day? Oh, we do want to give do the, the 
winners. Though. Winners. Yes, I was going to say, I was going to read them out. So we've drawn our winners from the day two homework. So Megan Jones, Katie Farinas, and Courtney Cleveland are the lucky winners. So you can just email hello at kathyheller.com to claim your prize. And we'll have more fun homework and prizes up today as well. So there's more chances to just keep diving in and swirling around in all of this just juicy possibility that's here. Yeah, it's going to be, you know, it's amazing. And and for me, often I see people and they'll have like, I'll say, what do you feel about what we've been doing this week? Like, it feels so good. And I'm like, do you want to be in this, you know, three month like live container? And they're like, I do. And some people like just join right away. And then sometimes people say, my only issue is I can't afford it. And I say, can you afford not to do this? Like what's going to change in your relationship with abundance if you don't? And it's interesting, right? Because so often, I mean, there was this woman, Teresa Greenway, who was a janitor and she was working three jobs because her son had all these extra things that he needed to do. And so she, she worked to pay for him. And I know with me and my girls, when they want to take tennis lessons, when they want to take piano, I don't even bat an eye. Right. And it's like, why don't we do that for ourselves? Right. Cause for kids, it's not what's taught, it's what's caught. And what are we modeling for them? So I just think it's really interesting how we make certain things priorities. Like we're going to pay for our data plan on our phone. That's of course, like unlimited data. And we're going to, you know, it actually shows that 70% of at least the American people, they have tons of things that are not in their budget that they spend anyway. And so what we found out is that the money gets spent anyway, but it usually gets spent on things that you don't really need or that you didn't really feel did that much for you. And instead, it's like, what would happen if you actually completely and totally started living from this place where you felt really good, might you change your health? Might you change your life? And then what if you started to just get messy and iterate? Could you start putting offers in the world to exchange your gifts for money that's already there? The market's already there, the client's already there. And could you set yourself up to say, you know what? It's actually really cool because I'm doing this program. I'm sort of invested. I've got skin in the game. And now I actually am compelled to do the work because I want to see if I can make back my investment and make it back times, I don't know, five, 10, 100, whoever knows. So it's very, very exciting to us. And we've just been, I've been so incredibly humbled and grateful to watch people's lives completely and totally change. So we can't wait to be with you guys during this three month program. Um, type a one in the chat or say me with an exclamation if you've already joined, I want to celebrate you. And there's a lot of alumni who are in this chat. So you don't really have to take my words for it. You can ask people who've been in this program, actually, like, what's it like? And does Kathy really show up? Or are there a team of other people who we didn't see who show up? It's like, no, we don't do that. Um, and sometimes people say, I want to take the program, but I'm not ready. And I say, what do you need to get ready to live your best life? And really and truly, what are you going to do in the next three months that's actually going to get you ready? Are you going to go back to sleep? And are you going to start living again, pumping that cortisol, living in the... All right, so let's celebrate. Julie's in, Samantha's in, Bridget, I love you. This is so fun. Celebrating you, celebrating you. And by the way, if you are alumni, you should DM us because if you haven't heard, there's an alumni discount, which you definitely would want to use. Um, but I always tell alumni to do it again because... If it was just a pre-recorded program, you already have it. But since we do these things live and we're live on Zoom and we see you and talk to you, you guys know we do hot seats and people get that one-on-one -on -one coaching experience and it's just priceless and everything always winds up being new in the moment. So I say, why not do it again and again, right? Because it is a practice. Like if I stop doing yoga or meditation, we've got problems. So I say, and by the way, I will say this, I am not everybody's person. That's impossible. And so I'm really, for some of you, won't be your person. And so I say, if I'm not your person, the next person who is your person, be with that person, right? If, you're, if your person is Byron Katie, show up for her workshops. If your person is Joe Dispenza, get your butt to one of his programs and spend the two grand for a few days because it's worth it. If you're pro, it's life changing, right? 
There's so many people who could be your person, but you know who that person is. And for many of you, there's no way it's going to be me. I'm not everybody's person. Not everybody can hear it from each person, right? But if I am your person, it's like, why would you wait for lightning to come again? Like, go in with it. Like, trust yourself, right? Be in this vibration. Invest in yourself. Invest in what's possible. But again, if I'm not your person, like there are so many incredible people out there doing incredible work. And I've had so many of them on my podcast and I value what they're doing and get yourself to their program so that you can wake up and live from this place where you get to create and you get to sound this tuning fork that sends back the most incredible, incredible, incredible gifts because it's your life. It's your life. And when you did that meditation yesterday and you talked to your 85 year old self, What's she going to want you to say? Because one day it's going to be it, right? And the greatest regret of the dying is I didn't live life on my terms. And I'm sitting here saying those kids who wore those capes, they opened the door. So we've got to really start to put on our cape. We've got to really start to change the way that we see and stop looking through this virtual reality headset. And then we've got to take our gifts and take that permission slip and being willing to get messy and being more more concerned about being generous than our ego is about how it looks and how it feels. And it's like, so what? It's uncomfortable for your ego. Your soul's not uncomfortable. Your soul is ready and loving and just wants to play and just wants to create. So it's time. So this was such an incredible session today. Tomorrow, if you go to kathyhoe.com slash party, you'll be inside the Zoom room. If you do the same thing you've been doing all week, you can do that too. And you can just watch it right here on Facebook. Colleen, anything else before we go? That is everything. We will see you all in the group and back tomorrow. Okay, so if you guys wanna join the program to get your 24 hour fast action bonuses, you can go to kathyheller.com slash join. And we can't wait to get started. Enrollment will close next week. Do your homework, we're gonna do more giveaways. Have a good night, guys.